Okay. So um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's community initiative on community engagement. I'm Paula Mueller, and along with Beth Bennell, um, we co-chair the initiative. So this project is designed to expand community outreach and to encourage others in the community to get engaged in making a difference. Um, our efforts focus on bringing information to the community about topics that impact us, facilitating presentations and conversations with individuals and organizations about smart and thoughtful topics, serving as a forum to encourage dialogue among our residents, local thought leaders, city officials, and other organizations, and finally, promoting active participation of Queen Anne residents in building a better community for all of us. Um, before I introduce Professor Starbird, I'd like to ask that you please mute your audio. Um, and if uh, you can certainly have your video on, please. <laughs> she likes to see your faces. Um, hold your questions until the Q&A segment. Um, you can also post questions in chat and we'll collect those. Uh, and finally, as you just heard, the program is being recorded so you will be able to view it at a later date um, or share it with friends who missed it tonight. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Starbird is an associate professor at the Department of Human-Centered Design and Engineering at the University of Washington. Her research is situated within human-computer interaction in the emerging field of crisis informatics, the study of how social media and other information communication technologies are used during crisis events. Currently, her work focuses on the production and spread of online rumors, misinformation, and disinformation in the context of crisis events. Um, Professor Starbird received her BS in computer science from Stanford in 1997, her PhD in technology, media, and society from the University of Colorado in 2012, and in 2019, she co-founded the UW Center for an Informed Public. Um, Dr. Starbird is also known for her career in women's basketball. She played for Stanford and was the 1997 Naismith College Player of the Year, um, helping Stanford make three consecutive Final Four appearances from 1995 to 1997. From 97 to 2006, um, Kate played professional basketball in the American Basketball League and Women's National Basketball Association, including stints with both the Seattle Reign, um, that's the basketball team, not the soccer team, and Seattle Storm. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to our guest, Kate Starbird. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and for that great um, introduction. And let me see if I can smoothly get my slides to go. And there they are, hopefully. Can you see my slides and not my notes? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, thank you again for that introduction. It was such a great job. And just to give a little bit more background, um, I have been, since I was a PhD student, uh, I think I started in 2007, um, studying uh, the use of social media and other online tools during crisis events. And um, did that for several years. And then around 2012 began to, um, to focus on misinformation and rumoring in the context of crisis events. And then around 2015, 2016, we realized we weren't just seeing accidental rumors and misinformation, we were beginning to see pervasive disinformation. It became a larger and larger part of what, what we've been studying. And so since about 2016, that's been a focus, uh, almost a singular focus of my, my, my team's research. And then now it's not just my team, I'm actually working with several collaborators at the Center for Informed Public and really excited about the work that, that we they were doing there um, and, and the work we will continue to do. So, um, and again, thank, thank you uh, for being here. So I'm gonna jump in to some content and I wanna start with this little shark. Um, this, uh, this shark and this current shark is a picture of a tweet that I took. Um, and the reason I'll focus on tweets here a lot is because tweets are uh, public. And it's, it's, it's easy for me to research them in a way that Facebook posts aren't. So a lot of the content I'm gonna show you are tweets. This is a tweet from, from a couple of weeks ago um, during Hurricane Henri. And it, it purports to be a shark swimming in the waters, uh, in the flood waters. So if, if you are a crisis researcher or really just anyone paying attention now on social media, you've seen the same shark swimming in the flood waters of every hurricane since about Hurricane Sandy. Actually Hurricane Irene, I think in 2011, because over and over again, 
people people spread this content um, and and say that this this shark is happening. Now, why do why do they do this? Well, often it's to get engagements, to get retweets, to get likes, to get attention, to grow their audiences. Um, the one this other post here was 2017. This guy got 150 thousand engagements um, by sharing this fake photo of a shark swimming in the in the waters and got a lot of attention and he cl he claimed to be a journalist if you went to his profile um, I don't know what that that really means what it mean meant used to mean anymore um, but surely um, was was spreading false content um, to get engagement so this is just an exa one example of many um, and and what I would say when I started in 2008 and 2009, misinformation was a small part of what we saw during crisis events. Um, more recently, it's become a larger and larger piece of crisis events and just the discourse more generally that we see in online spaces. And certainly in the last 18 months, as we've experienced this long-term um, crisis event of the pandemic, uh, we've seen um, it continue to escalate just in terms of the amount of content that out, that's out there that's false or misleading, and even in some cases, intentionally misleading, including content with the potential to do much more harm than a fake shark in the floodwaters. Um, for instance, if you look all the way back to March of 2020, I think many of us remember this, um, fal false claims about COVID treatments that began to spread. First, it was like, oh, you drink a lot of water, oh, don't take ibuprofen. Um, uh, yeah, do, yeah, water and salt, all, the, all these things that, that really, um, you know, had nothing to back them. Some of them, sometimes they spread them and they said, oh, a Stanford researcher says this, and it turns out that that wasn't true. And, um, and, and, and so we had a lot of, a lot of these things and um, maybe not too serious as long as no one got hurt, but we've seen that continue um, in, into, into treatments that are potentially more harmful. We also saw conspiracy theories about the causes of the disease, including um, conspiracy theories about um, the uh, that 5G cell towers were the real cause of COVID. It wasn't actually um, caused by the coronavirus. Um, and then others, uh, others about the origins and that obviously the, the origins of the disease are still under debate, but from the very first um, days of, that, that it began to be um, paid attention to here in the US and elsewhere, we could see conspiracy theories in, coming from China that claimed that it was created in a US lab um, at Fort Detrick and, and others. So. Um, so lots of conspiracy theories and, and, and speculation, including in, in some cases, the use of science, um, the misuse of science to, to push these ideas. This is an article that somehow got published. It later got retracted, um, but months and months later, it was still used to push, to support this idea that, this, that the disease was really caused by 5G technology, which is absolutely not true. I, I hope most of us understand that now. If you don't, I don't know if I have time to, to talk about it today, but, um, uh, there's uh, other things like this, you know, claims that the pandemic was planned by nefarious forces um, who were going to use vaccines to control us. And so this was a video. This was part of a video that that came out in May 2020. It had um, 10 million views on YouTube before they took it down and it began to spread through other mechanisms as well. And it, it was the first of many efforts to sow distrust in the vaccines. The vaccines weren't even available yet. They were still being tested, but they were spreading, um, they, they were sort of sowing distrust in the vaccines. Um, and tragically, you know, this kind of pervasive false and misleading information about vaccines has contributed to vaccine hesitancy. And I think many of us at the time knew that it would, we saw it coming, we saw this happening, we knew that this was going to be used to undermine trust in vaccines and certainly um, it, it continues and, and to the detriment of, of public health. Um, I think most of us again would agree. Um, so one of the interesting things is, is that in online spaces and online conversations about COVID-19, misinformation gets more engagement than factual information. A, a research study last week said six times more engagement. And engagement on social media posts can mean people like it or they comment on it or they share it. That's the stuff that kind of makes the whole thing churn. Um, and so, um, we're, we're kind of, a lot of us are addicted to these platforms and, and, and it's hard to get off of them. And when we do go to them, um, we're more likely to engage with, spend more time with and, and pass along things that aren't true than things that are true. And that's something um, that, that is part of, you know, why the, there's toxicities there. Um, I wanna point out um, that 
when we talk about online spaces, I am talking about social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, all these um, probably other names that I, I don't have listed here as well. But I'm also, I also want to note that this includes email lists. A lot of us have signed up for something somewhere and they sold our name to somebody else. And, and the e email that comes to us is often toxic and is, is part of these, and it's the same kind of content that we might see on Facebook or somewhere else. Um, and also cable news. Cable news picks up content from social media. Cable news pundits push out content on social media and they're really part of the same ecosystem um, that, that again, gets more engagement for the sensational stuff that may be false and misleading. So along with COVID misinformation, we've also experienced disinformation that's undermined trust in our election systems uh, and our democracy more broadly. And that's what I'm gonna talk more about as we continue with this talk. Um, the truth is that we have a misinformation problem. Um, and though you know the media, uh, including traditional media and cable news contribute to the problem, Online social media pl platforms are, are playing an outsized role. So I'm, I'll mostly focus um, on that here. But before we get too far, I wanna do some definitional work to make sure we're all on the same page. And I, I wanna start with, um, with the difference between disinformation and misinformation, because today I'm gonna be talking a lot about disinformation. That shark actually kind of disinformation, some of the stuff we saw around COVID-19 was just misinformation. And let me kind of give you a sense of what how we're using those those terms differently. So misinformation is information that's false, but not necessarily intentionally false. Um, and so, you know, in the crisis space, sometimes, you know, a crisis just happens and people are trying to figure out what's going on and they might get something wrong and that becomes a rumor and that rumor turns out to be false. That's misinformation. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't meant to hurt somebody. It can hurt somebody, but it wasn't necessarily intentional. Disinformation, on the other hand, is false or misleading information that's purposefully seeded or spread for a specific objective, for instance, financial or political or reputational or sometimes just for fun. Um, but disinformation, it has that intent behind it. It's also effective disinformation isn't necessarily false the, as a whole. It's often just misleading. It's often built around a true or plausible core and then layered with distortions and exaggerations intending to shape how others perceive reality. Through this view, disinformation can sometimes be resistant to fact checking, especially on a single piece of content. And it can't always simply be reduced to false information. That's why you'll hear me say false or misleading or unsubstantiated. Some conspiracy theories are not even falsifiable. It's almost impossible to completely fact check them. So this is why it's so difficult. We're like, oh, we just have better fact checkers. Actually, disinformation is pretty resistant to simple fact checking. Disinformation also functions not as a single piece of content or a Facebook post or one story on, on, on cable news, but as a bunch of different information actions or a campaign. Uh, and again, so it's hard to just fact check it as one piece of content because one piece of content may be true or partially true, but it sits in a larger you know, context and with these other kinds of actions and amplifications where it begins to mislead or distort perceptions of reality. And this is where it gets really tricky on the definitional side because we do talk about the misinformation is unintentional or not necessarily intentional. Disinformation is intentional. Well, it turns out that though disinformation campaigns intentionally mislead, many participants in disinformation campaigns are unwitting agents. They're unaware that the information they're spreading is false or of their role in the larger campaign. So this information may be created by someone else for a political purpose or a financial purpose, but someone spreading it might not know that and they might actually think it's true. And so it's not necessarily that th this person intends to do it or not, but like, why is this spreading? Why has it been amplified? And that's what you kind of get, what, whether it's disinformation or misinformation. So um, in the modern, you know, one of the great things about the internet is that we could all participate. We're all citizen journalists now. We're all, we've all, we, we've all got the capacity to shape the information spaces, although many of us have different sized voices than others. Um, but turns out with that capacity, there's, there could have been responsibility and I'm not sure we were up to the task. And so it turns out that mis and disinformation don't spread themselves, we spread them as, in, as online participants. So many of us pass along that email or pass along that Facebook post or retweet that tweet. Um, and that's sort of how things spread. So um, I'm pretty sure so 
all of us, maybe not all, maybe there's a few of you out there, but you're better, better people than, not, than I am. Um, but I think most of us have, have at some point spread misinformation, whether online or offline, we've passed along a rumor. Um, but why are we vulnerable to believing and spreading this and disinformation? And there's a couple, I'm not gonna cover all the reasons, but I'm gonna couple, cover a couple of things of why, why we're vulnerable. So one of the reasons just individually, psychologically, why we're vulnerable, certain kinds of cognitive biases, just the way our, our brains and psychology work. Um, one of them is confirmation bias. We tend to seek out evidence and even interpret new evidence that we find in ways that confirm our existing beliefs. Right? So we're more likely to absorb the information in the world to align with what we already believe. Motivated reasoning is, some, is, is very similar. We tend to use our reasoning skills and our critical thinking to support what we already believe and critique what we don't want to believe. And so we always say, oh, more critical thinking. We need the kids and the young people to just be better critical thinkers. Where it turns out that no matter how good our critical thinking skills are, if we only bring them to, uh, to take apart the things we don't like and we don't bring them to take apart the things we do like, we can actually work ourselves into some very strange um, perceptions of reality. And so those are the, some of, just some of the cognitive biases. There's a lot more, but that's all I have time to cover. But there's also something about our online media environments that are making us vulnerable as well. It's not just, there's something about this moment and this moment has something to do with our, with our media environments. And, and researchers debate how much of this is about our media environments versus our psychology or something else going on in society. But I think it's pretty clear it's playing a role um, and there's a couple of different ways that it plays that role um, or it, the online media play that role. So one of those are bubbles and echo chambers. We've heard a lot about these if you've been reading anything about the internet in the last 10 years, but that the, maybe the last five years, that the networks we create online. So who we choose to follow, who's in our network, who, who are we signing up their email lists from, you know, who are our Facebook friends, those networks as well as the algorithms that shape what we see online. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, they, they give us more of what we do like, often aligning with what are our existing views and less of what we don't like. And so um, one of the things a few years ago was a shock to a lot of the audiences that I spoke to. I don't think it's a shock anymore, but that when you sign up for one of the social media sites and you pick some accounts to follow, the, the, account, the, the social media platform doesn't just give you all the content from those accounts. It chooses what to send to you and what not to send to you because you honestly don't have time to look through all the content, content that's being produced. So almost everything we see in online spaces is curated by a computer program. And that computer program learns what we like and sends us more of what we like. And often if we like things that are aligning with what we already believe, it'll send us more stuff that aligns with what we already believe. Another thing is um, when we engage online, many of us, we tend to engage within our social and political identities, which is when we're most vulnerable. We tend to bring those things into these spaces, something about the way the spaces have, 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 have just sort of formed and, and taken shape. You can see it when people put you know, markers of these identities in their social media profiles. They'll put a hashtag um, with, their, with their political leaning in there or maybe some sort of symbol. So a lot of us, when we're engaging online, are doing it within these, within these political biases. And when we see stuff that counters what we believe, it's often marked with social and political affiliations that make it easy for us to reject it. So it's easy for, I, I have family members who are very far right and they, they were telling me, well, I don't just watch Fox News, I also, also watch NBC, MSNBC. But I know when I go to MSNBC that I'm not going to like it, right? So the same thing, when we see that content that we don't like, it's content from the other side that may give us another perspective, we're already, we get the signals, we already know that we're going to reject it because it's dressed up in these wrappers that we, that we have learned to reject, right? So these kinds of things weren't there in our media environment, you know, 30 or 40 years ago in the same way, and they are now. Oops. Um, another thing that happens when we're online is that we're often moving too fast. Um, we're combing through tons of information, even with the algorithms only giving us some things, there's just so much content coming at us. Um, and, and so we rarely engage in the kind of slow thinking that it might, might allow us to like reflect and be more thoughtful and make better decisions about the content that we're seeing. Um, and so that, that seems to be something that's, that's playing into things as well. With, with even us recommending the platforms to help people slow down might make them help us make better decisions. I'll get back to some of that in the end, but I just wanna kind of set up, um, you know, some of the reasons that, that, that we're here. 
Um, another thing I want to point out about disinformation is that especially pervasive disinformation is a threat to democracy. And this is something that's coming from a, a couple of different research uh, sort of scholars from actually different kinds of fields. But when we look at how disinformation works, a lot of it, especially if you look at um, historical disinformation, Russian disinformation, and then how that's been kind of adopted in other kinds of places, um, it's often designed not to convince, but to confuse, to create doubt, to make us so skeptical, skeptical that we don't know what we can trust anymore, to undermine our, our trust in information, to erode our trust in institutions and media and science and government, and ultimately our trust in each other. When we see these big divides online, disinformation builds into those divides. It loves those divides. It loves to you know, push those divides outward and then utilize that um, to spread itself and, and to shape us towards its purposes. Disinformation also destabilizes the common ground that citizens and democratic societies need to stand upon to govern themselves. We don't have to agree on everything and we can't. The whole point of democracy, we have different ideas and we come together and fight them out, but fight them out, not fight them out, argue them out, have discourse around it. Um, but, but we have to have some shared understanding what the rules are of like who the valid winners of the elections are, these kinds of things in order for democracy to work. And, and disinformation can go right at that, um, especially historically Russian disinformation went there and now we're seeing this domestic disinformation function in the, those same ways. So um, I, I told you I'm gonna talk about elections. I'm gonna talk about two elections. I'm gonna tell a tale of two elections to kind of give a sense of some of the different ways we've been thinking about disinformation over the last five years. Um, it seems like there's been a lot of different stuff and hopefully I can add um, some insight there. So if we look at the story of disinformation 2016, so let's go back to 2016. Um, we've got a lot of elections going on, but our presidential election, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Um, and there's this, this story of interference and it's a story of, of a foreign, um, sort of a foreign campaign uh, that used inauthentic actors and inauthentic, inauthentic, among other things, there was multiple dimensions to their campaign. But when we look at the social media portion of disinformation, they were using inauthentic accounts in this coordinated way. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that was. So we know many of you may have heard about the Internet Research Agency. It was this, it was a building in St. Petersburg uh, in Russia. And there were these these uh, individuals, we call their accounts trolls. I'm not sure it's the right word to call them, but um, these individuals that were operating social media accounts uh, that, that were impersonating US citizens and targeting um, the US election to try to shape that towards the political goals of Russia. And in they did many things. They, they sowed division, they undermined trust in results. They claimed that there was voter fraud. Um, they also encouraged people on the right to vote for Trump and they encourage people on the left to not vote for Hillary, um, to vote for either a third party candidate or to stay home. And this was part of a larger strategy of Russian government uh, to interfere in the 2016 election. So we studied this accidentally. Um, our team was actually at the time, um, we had a student who was looking at, um, we were studying shooting events in the United States. And then we also started studying the discourse around Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter to, related to shooting events. And so we had a lot of data and we were looking at the discourse of how people were talking about different shooting events through these different frames of Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter. And, um, and acknowledging here that, that, the, that the Black Lives Matter folks were arguing against systemic racism by police against US citizens and the anti-Black Lives Matter folks or the Blue Lives Matter folks were trying to shift that frame to, to make a, a political argument to counter that in a way that many of us feel was disingenuous, but, but they, they certainly um, have some other frames about you know, protecting police and other things. Um, this conversation, when we look at our data, is highly polarized. And so let me just explain really quickly what this is, because right now it's just a bunch of, a bunch of dots, but each of these little um, dots is a, uh, is a Twitter user and who shared at least one tweet about Black Lives Matter, or Blue Lives Matter related to a shooting event in 2016. And they're closer together when they retweeted each other and they're further apart if they didn't retweet each other. And when we look at that structure over time, what we see is we have two very separate groups that are retweeting each other and not not retweeting across. They're kind of everybody in red is retweeting people in red and people in, in the blue or the green side are retweeting people in the blue or green side. 
Um, and it reveals these sort of separate communities or echo chambers or bubbles that we talk about. And the structure of almost every politicized conversation in the US looks like this. Um, sometimes it has a third group, but, um, but most of it looks like this. So here, um, this graph reveals this two different sides and we have um, the political left and pro-Black Lives Matter are on the left and, and anti-Black Lives Matter are on the right. Of course, I just flip them around to make sure that would line up so they don't make sense to us. Um, and so um, we did a study of this. We, we looked at the discourse. We took a bunch of tweet examples to show what was going on. Um, in some places, this was regular conversation. In other places, we saw very like vitriolic conversation, people saying some really nasty things about each other, about the other side. Um, we wrote a paper about it. Um, we, at, at times, the discourse was emotional, divisive, and honestly uncomfortable for our research team. It was really kind of troubling to look at the, the, the tone of the conversation. And I don't mean to, to, to manage someone's tone, but there was some really kind of horrific things said there. Um, we completed the study in about October 2017. A few weeks later, in November 2017, Twitter released a list of accounts that were associated with the Internet Research Agency, the Russian trolls, that Russian troll farm I showed you. Um, and and we, I, I was looking at their list, and I said, gosh, these account names look familiar. Um, some of them we had featured in our paper uh, for some of the more vitriolic content that we'd seen had actually come from some of these accounts that were Russian trolls. And so I asked my students to map where in these networks the Russian trolls were. And at the time, the first time the students had sent it over to me, I had sent it right back. I said, I don't, that's not what it looks like. Send me the real one. And, and the, the student was like, no, this is, this is it, Kate. This is, this is what it is. Um, and it turns out that the, the Russian trolls were, were, were embedded on both sides of the conversation. And they, in particular, they, uh, this misrepresents a little bit. They actually targeted both almost exactly equally. Uh, so we can see in other conversations, they had just as many right-leaning accounts as they had left-leaning accounts. And they were retweeted just as much on the right as they were on the left. And they infiltrated the different sides of our political discourse and began to, some of them began to become influencers in those conversations. Um, there is an orange account on the left in that embedded in there, um, who uh, was retweeted by the CEO of Twitter, Jack. And I believe me, I think I also retweeted that account. I certainly remember that account spreading content. And so um, I wanna drive this home is that we're all vulnerable to disinformation. Disinformation targets people on both sides of the political spectrum. Now the Russian trolls didn't care about Black Lives Matter or anti-Black Lives Matter. They're just trying to manipulate this, this conversation towards their ends, right? And so though we may think, oh, they align with my views, I'm gonna re, you know, retweet them or repost them. What actually happened was they began to manipulate these, these conversations. And um, I, I can't say this is actual cause, actually causal, but if you look, you can see them kind of on the outsides of those two, of those two groups. And, and metaphorically, at the very least, we can see them trying to work to pull these groups apart. Um, not that you need to in this case, but if you think about discourse more broadly, um, political discourse in the United States about these trolls trying to pull us apart. So um, we're all vulnerable to, to disinformation, but I wanna drive this point home as well, is that we, can, we need to separate our vulnerability to disinformation to who intentionally deploys information for their gain. And that's highly asymmetric right now. We can look across the globe over and over again, we see disinformation used by authoritarian leaders, mostly right-wing populists to gain power. Um, but they, that doesn't mean that they're the only ones spreading disinformation because though we might disagree with it, we can be used by disinformation campaigns to, su to support things that we don't necessarily agree with. All right, so that's the 2016. Um, so this, there's a story of 2016 that was foreign and authentic and coordinated. Turns out there was a lot of domestic disinformation in 2016, but that's not the story we tell. We, sto we tell the story of foreign disinformation. Um, but the story of, of 2020 is very different. Uh, and that one um, is, is largely a domestic disinformation. Most of what we saw in, in 2020 was domestic. It was largely coming from inside the US. There were foreign activities, but they weren't playing a major role. They were mostly just amplifying things that they saw um, in the domestic context. It was largely authentic. They weren't using fake accounts. People that were who they said they were were sharing disinformation. Um, they maybe they believed it or not, but they continuous, you know, continued continuously spread it. They were often blue check or verified accounts that were the biggest spreaders of disinformation in 2020. 
um, along with some more anonymous members of the crowd. And it wasn't entirely coordinated. There's no top-down puppet master uh, playing the, all this, you know, pulling all the strings of disinformation. In some cases, it was organic, um, with everyday people creating and spreading disinformation about the election. And I'm going to tell you uh, and explain to you a little bit um, of how that happened. And I'm going to focus here. There's different disinformation strains, but the one that our team focused on uh, starting in August, and it turned out, you know, through January 6th, and still um, was on uh, cl false claims of voter fraud that were used to undermine tr uh, trust in the election and eventually the election results. And so that's it's what they might call the big lie is what I'll focus on here for the rest of the talk. So um, in this case, the 2020 disinformation tar uh, campaign targeting the integrity of our elections began at the top. The most influential conveyor of these messages was the former president himself. Um, this tweet was posted all the way back in June 2020, where um, it was one of several early posts about voter fraud in the election cycle from, from Donald Trump or his campaign. And he claimed without evidence that the election would be rigged, um, that ballots would be printed and ostensibly filled out in foreign countries, and that it would be the scandal of our times. Uh, the tweet received more, more than 100,000 retweets, so it's a, a very widely seen um, piece of content. Um, nearly 300,000 likes, so lots and lots of engagements. Of course, we know that misinformation receives a lot of engagements. Um, and by this point in the evolution of Twitter's ecosystem, um, President Trump had a huge microphone with many dedicated followers who were avidly and sort of systematically engaging with, liking, and retweeting his content. And so everything he put out there spread very quickly and very far. And so this narrative was really seated at the top. And I think even as I explain some other dynamics, we have to keep in mind that this was continuously kind of reinforced by, by not just President Trump, but his, his campaign and, and many of the right-wing media figures that, um, that supported him. It also incorporated the effort um, and the work of thousands of others, including partisan media out, uh, outlets, social media all-stars, and everyday political activists. And I'm gonna show you one case here to give you a, a chance to see this. Over, over the course of the fall before the election, we saw numerous incidents of false or misleading narratives about mail-in ballots go viral. Because initially this, this voter fraud, the big lie was mostly targeted on, targeted on mail-in ballots to start. And some of these um, just worked to sow distrust in mail-in voting generally. Others explicitly claimed voter fraud. And so here's an example from back in September. It claims with a photo that more than a thousand mail-in ballots had been found in a dumpster. And it was building on this narrative that you can't trust the mail-in voting process. And this one was sent out by a reporter at The Blaze. Elijah Schaefer is a reporter at The Blaze, um, which is a right-wing media outlet. I also wanna point out he was in Nancy Pelosi's office on January 6th, ostensibly working as a reporter, but these, there's a connection between January 6th and, and the misinformation that we saw. This has been in my slides since November, so I, I had no idea that it would be um, so um, prescient. Um, so he ends up, in, so he says that these, these ballots have been found in a dumpster. It's big, if true. This is a way that they often spread false information. They kind of put this like, oh, I'm just, I'm just speculating. So big, if true. Um, turns out it was not true. Um, so it turns out that these envelopes are envelopes from ballots from the 2018 election that they had to wait 18 months to destroy them and they were destroying them on schedule in the place that they normally destroy them at, at a, so that they were throwing them away within the way that the election, um, the elections were. And so it wasn't related to the 2020 election at all. And yet um, it went viral. It eventually re it receives more than 250,000 tweets and retweets and engagements and and spread very far. Um, I'm going to talk really quickly about this graph because I'm going to show you another one later. But this graph shows the kind of the kind of spread over time of this of this narrative. So time runs left to right, and um, and the number of tweets total at that time is on the it's on the y-axis. So at the end of this period, you can see it's about 20 um, 25,000, a little more than 25,000 retweets, and it continues to go past this graph. But what I wanted to show you is in, in this graph, each of these little shapes is one Twitter user, it's different kinds of tweets, you don't really need to know that as much, but one Twitter user, and, it, and it's sized by the amount of their audience. So it can show you how certain pieces of content, people with big audiences help to spread this content. And if we look at some of those big accounts that help to push this to spread, we have some familiar faces for some of us um, a, of accounts that are in right-wing media that we would see over and over again, um, or certain kind of right-wing influencers, and then eventually 
um, Donald Trump, one of Donald Trump's adult sons who um, repeatedly, both of his adult sons repeatedly would amplify these false claims of, of voter fraud over and over again. And so similar, we, we, we plotted these, we plotted over, we have like 400 different events and probably 200 of them are false claims of voter fraud. And over and over again, we would plot them and they would look very similar with some of the same, of the same characters participating. So a small number of repeat offender accounts drove a large percentage of online disinformation in the 2020 election. We kept seeing that same network of influencers over and over again, hyperpartisan media outlets, political leaders, and a handful of social media all-stars. Um, this is a table of the top 20 um, or, or the folks that, that spread, they were influential in spreading more than 10 distinct different claims of, of voter fraud. And we can see um, some, some familiar faces here, including sort of the Gateway Pundit, which has now been largely removed from social media for just repeatedly spreading false content um, and some other right-wing media. And then, a, and then President Trump and his two uh, adult sons who were very influential over and over again in spreading these false claims. Um, so I want to also point out the disinformation spread on the left, disinformation of claiming voter fraud or, or um, sowing distress in election results or the election process. Um, there were many claims, especially sort of August, around uh, claiming that the Postal Service was intentionally marring the ability to vote by mail. And um, they often include photographs like this one. And this photograph is actually of a refurbishing uh, lot where they refurbish these. And if you go there now, these will still be there. This is what they do. Um, and so someone took this, this photograph, they took it out of context and they used it to, 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 spread, um, to spread this misleading narrative that the, that the um, uh, US Postal Service was intentionally um, hurting the mail-in voting process. So uh, again, and, and this spread on the left, this spread very far on the left. There's a couple other uh, incidents we can see spread on the left. For the most part, um, all of, uh, of the folks in this table here are, are right-wing influencers. If we go down to about 50, we can see some left-wing influencers that were doing things. And they, of course they stopped. The, the left-wing influencers stopped, most of them stopped when, when Joe Biden um, was finally uh, um, announced as, as the winner, but, um, but we're all, again, we're all vulnerable to these kind of things. It might have looked differently if, if Donald Trump had won the election um, in terms of how, how things spread after election day. So this, this effort wasn't simply top down. Um, it, it was actually what we call participatory with, um, with media, political media elites uh, actually participating with these other kinds of dynamics that were more bottom up with everyday people sharing their own experiences, their own misperceptions of being disenfranchised or finding out what they th thought to be evidence of, of voter fraud. And I wanted to give you one case of this to really kind of see how, how this worked and maybe get a sense and maybe a little bit of empathy. This case has given me a lot of empathy and understanding for how people got caught up in the voter fraud lies and actually became you know, mobilized, even why some people may have ended up uh, on the Capitol grounds on, on January 6th. Um, so this is Sharpie Gate, and it's this narrative um, that began with a number of people posting stories about how they or someone they knew had been given Sharpie pens to vote and how the pens had bled through and how they were worried about their votes may not, may not have been counted. And this started very early on election day and we can actually see it in some of the early voting as well. Um, official accounts attempted to correct these concerns on election day, even early on election day, explaining the ballots were actually designed to be used with Sharpies. They like them because they drive faster and the machines can, can count them quicker and they're more clear. And that the bleeding doesn't affect it because it's actually staggered. So the bleed through doesn't register when they flip it over to, anyways, it's designed that way. But the official statements did little to alleviate the concerns, which grew as many people shared their fears. And initially the tone was, uh, was one of concern, like people were worried that their votes might not be counted and there was directives to bring their own pens so they wouldn't have to worry about this. But as time went on, the content took on a more suspicious tone, reflecting this existing collective belief that the election would be rigged. Um, and eventually the discourse shifted to explicit false uh, accusation that this was an intentional effort to disenfranchise specifically Trump voters. And we could see all these online people begin to like opportunistically spread this because they thought that it lined up with their belief that their, their existing belief that the election was going to be rigged. And this shift occurs, you know, it begins to take off right as what 
it, it spread in different places or on election day, it spread in Chicago, it spread. And then when uh, on election night, when Arizona was called for Joe Biden by Fox News, all of a sudden there was some claims about this in Arizona and people began to find those claims and make them go viral. And so it became this political opportunity to try to, to, to battle against this idea that Biden might have won Arizona. And so they opportunistically were spreading this um, at that time. And one of the more interesting things that really gives me some insight into what's going on here was um, that on November, November 4, the day after the election, so this is a day later, um, the Sharpie Gate narrative is still taking off. And a number of people begin to share this evidence that their vote has been canceled. And, um, and so this evidence begins to be reshared very widely. And they're like, oh, my vote was canceled. I went online to this website and they begin to share the website, go online, check the website and they, they'll see that their vote is, is canceled. And, and, and so this person claimed that she'd voted, it used a Sharpie and then it, and it appears that she sincerely thought that her ballot had been canceled. Except if you look really closely at the image she shared, it was captured from a website that gave people the status of their mail-in ballot, which was by law canceled when they voted in person or when they didn't return it. So what's happening here is, is these folks are going to the site and then they're misinterpreting the evidence on the site to, to think that they've, they've, been, they've been cheated. And, and so this is a misinterpretation, but it becomes this very real um, experience to them. So it wasn't true, but the person thought it was true because she'd heard from politicians and the media that she trusted that they would be cheating. And then she misinterpreted the event and ended up thinking that she'd been cheated. And it can be really hard to change this person's mind to have them understand that they, that they weren't cheated. Not surprisingly, when we look closely, some of the same right-wing influencers that, that I showed you above appear here, just as this thing that begins to take off, these are the folks helping uh, make it take off. So Charlie Kirk here is almost, you know, super influential in making this particular, I don't know if you can see it, but this thing just begins to take off. And then I don't show you the rest of the graph because it goes into the stratosphere. Um, but right as this begins to spread really widely, Charlie Kirk is there. Charlie Kirk works for this um, TPUSA TP uh, group and um, they sent, he helped organize buses that went uh, on January 6th to the, to the, to the rallies uh, on the Capitol. So you, there's these connections between, between that and I'll uh, hopefully draw a little bit of that, although I don't have a lot of time. So President Trump and his campaign didn't just prime their audience to be receptive to false narratives of voter fraud. They inspired them to produce those narratives themselves and then echoed those false claims back to them. They're not telling them what, you know, they're not telling them, you know, this is what happened and this is what happened. They're saying this is going to happen. And then everyday people actually created the disinformation and they didn't even know it wasn't true. So it's hard, it's like misinformation, it's disinformation. Well, it's part of this broader campaign, but a lot of the people producing it didn't even realize that it was disinformation. Most of the, when we do our research, we look really closely at the content. Most of the people sharing claims about voter fraud sincerely believe those claims. Um, many of them felt that they or their Trump voting family members had been personally experienced being defrauded. Some made formal complaints, they filed affidavits um, saying they'd been disfranchised and it's very hard to correct this kind of propaganda. Some 30% of Americans still believe that Joe Biden is not the legitimate winner of 2016 election. And I doubt that they'll ever change their minds. I've seen their content, I doubt that they'll ever change their minds. One of the things we've seen a lot in the last 18 months is this mobilization on top of the misinformation from the anti-mask protests to the stop the steal protests is that these misinformation narratives, these participatory dynamics are, are leveraged to bring people out in person to protests, to insurrection, insurrection attempts, um, to city council meetings where they're yelling at each other. Uh, and so for, for, stop the, for the Sharpie Gate, Sharpie, Sharpie get, gets wrapped into the larger Stop the Steal movement, which begins to organize protests after the election into December, and then eventually is part of what um, is used to, to, organize, um, to organize on January 6th. So the rallies that brought the insurrectionists to DC were organized in part under the Stop the Steal banner. And I've got some other slides there. I don't, I don't think we need to go into detail of, of, about exactly how, how this comes together, but a lot of the folks that we would see on social media posting were part of that organization. And then some of just everyday people got wrapped up into this um, and really thought that they, were, um, that they were patriots, that they were doing the right thing, that they, 
that they were, you know, writing a wrong that they had experienced and they, they really thought that they had experienced this. And if we had any doubt about the connections between that disinformation campaign and the January 6 events, we can look to the Twitter account of the US, uh, of President Trump that day, where he repeats the false claim about his sacred landslide victory was stolen from him and his followers and who he refers to then as patriots. And in their minds, they are patriots, um, uh, which is such, it's such a hard thing for a lot of us who, who, who honestly can see through some of these. We have the evidence to see through some of this. Um, and it's hard for us to come to terms with the fact that these folks really did feel that they were doing the right thing. So um, participatory disinformation is a really powerful dynamic. And I, again, um, I think we all might be a little bit more vulnerable to this than, than we recognize. So it's a threat to democratic societies. We're all vulnerable as individuals and collectively. We're especially vulnerable when we're engaging with information from within our social, our political or social religious identities. Um, disinformation can be foreign, it can be domestic. A lot of times nowadays it's integrated, it's both. There are international networks that are kind of working together to spread this stuff, like the son of President Bolsonaro and the son of Donald Trump are both retweeting the same misinformation in our data set. Um, in 2020, a small number of often blue check accounts had an outsized influence on the spread of disinformation. And we really think that social media platforms can be doing something different about that. Um, and that disinformation in the online era is highly participatory with both top down and bottom up dynamics. And it's leveraging the work of unwitting crowds of, of all of us. And just cause I know this is Queen Anne and many of you are probably left-leaning, I'm left-leaning. I wanna remind us again, that we are vulnerable to spreading this stuff. This is a piece of content that went viral last week through the Rolling Stone. Uh, Rolling Stone Magazine it, uh, it appeared on MSNBC, Rachel Maddow tweeted it out, hundreds of thousands of, of engagements, and it's just not true. Um, the, the, the hospitals are full, but they're not full of, of people who are having ivermectin overdoses. It was a misinterpretation of, a, of some comments by a doctor. So, um, and the only reason it went viral is because it went viral with this, with this false headline. So just a reminder that we, that this all, this all is, is, we're all part of these same ecosystems, even though um, there are differences of, some of them are being used to, by political leaders who are amplifying them and some maybe not as much. So what can we do? Online participants, you know, what do, we, what do we do about this? It, it seems complicated and I'm not gonna say that I have the solutions, but I know a lot of people ask me individually, how do we become better, more responsible, productive participants in these online spaces? Um, a couple of things I tell folks, um, slow down. Uh, it, you know, especially when we're, when we're, when we're online, um, even when you're on cable news, they're throwing things at you time and time again, like stop the thing, put it on pause or just wait an hour, it'll come back around look the things up, try to get something from the other side. I often look up their, whatever their headline is and say debunk with it. And just to see what someone might be saying that's, that's different, um, learn to recognize manipulation. There are some good trainings out there, digital media literacy. I really recommend the SIFT method. My colleague, Mike Caulfield has advanced that idea and it's a really great method. You can look that up um, and, and to kind of just be better consumers of information online. Um, but also we tend to think that, that information literacy is all in our heads, um, but actually it mostly gets us through our emotions, through our gut, right? So it's really, I wish you could see me, I'm just pointing at my gut. Misinformation manipulates us through our, through our emotion and um, that's what activates us to spread it. And so it's really important to sort of tune in to how we're being manipulated emotionally um, I like to say, like, whenever I think I'm about to spike the political football, like, oh, I won this one. There, the other side is totally wrong. This new piece of information just proves that I'm right. I usually step back. Um, there's probably a misinformation flag on the field, and it's all coming back. So just when you really feel self-righteous about something, that's the, that's the best time to go double check or even triple check, um, and maybe even wait a, a couple hours for that to resolve before passing it along. Also, we have to learn how to take responsibility. First off, everyone makes mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes, but when we make mistakes, we need to own up. We are, we're citizen reporters now, and we need to act like it. We need to learn how to make retractions. We don't just hide our mistakes. We need to tell people if we pass something along and they've passed it along, we need to go back and tell them that we were wrong so they have a chance to tell the people that, that saw them that, that they were wrong. Learn how to correct ourselves and learn how to correct others, but only with empathy. I think that's our hardest thing. If we, if we don't have empathy, if we don't understand that we're all vulnerable to this, it, we're trying to correct people, they're just gonna dig in their heels and they're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to come together and have 
productive conversations. So, so just to remember that we, we're all part of these same dynamics. Um, I have some ideas for, for, for things that we need to do, build back trust and information. <laughs> it's just a lot of work to be done there. Um, restoring local journalism, I think is gonna be critically important. We are so lucky in Seattle just to have a local paper, um, but most places don't. <laughs> and, um, and increasingly, uh, even the papers we do have that seem local aren't really. And so we need to figure out ways to build back local journalism. We need to start pushing platforms, whether it's through government, through so, sort of you know user-based action, um, push platforms to address harmful mis and disinformation. In particular, we're, we're trying to push this idea that you know high visibility users should have to take more responsibility, um, you know, com commensurate to their impacts. Um, and and so if someone is a blue check account, they shouldn't be able to just repeatedly post mis and disinformation that would have slowed down a lot of the, the stuff about voter fraud. And then education. And I think education is not a K through 12 thing and here it's a K through 99 thing. We all need to better understand how modern information ecosystems work, the relationship between networks and algorithms and how we can become healthier participants in these spaces. And finally, it's not gonna be solved in a day but we've just got to chip away at this problem from all sides any way we can. I do think it's one of our challenges of our times. All right, and that is it. And I'm sorry, I went a little bit long. I was, I just really wanted to explain things well today. So hopefully that was helpful and I'm happy to stay around a couple extra minutes for questions. And just thank you to all the postdoctoral fellows, the students, the collaborators, um, and all of our, our funders who've been fantastic and so supportive of the work we do. Wow, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I think everybody was, was like me, pretty engrossed in the topic. It's a very interesting one. And hopefully by, by having this forum tonight, um, we've begun to chip away at some of the mis and disinformation. Um, it's um, certainly enlightening, a little frightening, I would say. I don't give a happy talk. I'm sorry about that. It's not uplifting. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I should warn people. Yeah. I should come with a disclaimer. This is not it's an uplifting far. talk. So I, I have a, kind of a general question, um, and I guess it's, it's almost like, you know, how do we end up here? It, when, as I listen to the things that um, sort of prompt and promote and perpetuate disinformation and misinformation, more disinformation, but it's like um, part of it has to be just the sheer volume of information that's out there, and it makes it really difficult for people to sift through it um, but also maybe we've gotten a little bit lazy about sort of doing that fact checking um, i i probably am guilty of that myself i may never look at the new york times again in the same way but uh, <laughs> so can you speak to that at all um you know we weren't even taught how to fact check thing. I mean, there were th even our current trainings that we have at, at the university and the libraries are, are about like, how do you look up sources? How do you do this? How do you do that? No, there's no like verification um, kind of training. And even if they did, they usually said to triangulate. Well, the triangulation breaks in the online ecosystems. Even the things we were taught don't work in these spaces. One of our early studies on disinformation showed how disinformation campaigns would put put the same false content in multiple different media outlets that had different political leanings. And so you would think that you were triangulating and you weren't. Um, and so like it breaks some of the ways to, ways that we've even been taught. And in many cases we haven't been taught. So the literacy is still catching up. Literacy programs, digital media literacy, we don't even know the words to call it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we, we don't know yet what, you know, what to do. So I would not, I wouldn't say that it's laziness. I, I, I really do think it's a, it's a function of um, just not being prepared for these media ecosystems. The media ecosystems themselves weren't prepared. They didn't recognize that they would be so easily manipulated or that some of these toxicity would resonate. Um, that, that, that little things that were bad would, would begin to just have these echo effects that get bigger and bigger and spin out of control based on the ways that their recommendation algorithms work. Um, so there's a lot of things here. And I, I think it's, though, though I think it's really important that we do learn to become better participants and we do learn to take responsibility. I don't think it's right for us to say it's, it's our fault as users of these systems. I think it's, it's, we just, there was no way 
to, to have been ready for this. Things changed. Uh, the rules of engagement with information changed underneath us really quickly um, without any, any preparation. Beth, I think there's some questions in chat. Do you wanna? Yep, sure. So Kari, thanks. Kari coming from North Carolina. <laughs> Kari asked, um, is some of this due to the elimination of the FCC fairness doctrine? And I mean, that kind of gets into the sort of the regulatory framework. So if, it, that's a whole nother topic, but definitely the, the fairness doctrine in terms of with that reinstating that help address the spread of disinformation. Yeah, I mean, I think we can look at a long history of media and yellow journalism and propaganda and different ways that, that we've been manipulated or not in different times. But certainly if we're thinking about where some of the polarization has happened and how we're sort of ending up in sort of media um, echo chambers, um, I think there's, there's some debate again in the research community of, of you know, what, what is what, but I do think that, that the loss of the fairness doctrine, I mean, it, it, it didn't necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily apply to some of the things that we have now because we have no regulation for, for social media platforms, but certainly like um, the dawn of like cable, cable news, 24 seven um, content dressed up as news that's really political entertainment. Um, and, and the fact that that's, that kind of made a soft ground for where social media filled in. Um, but we can look at some of the toxicities around missing disinformation, exploitation, um, manipulation, and sort of the rise of right-wing populism is not just happening in the United States. It's actually happening all over the world. We've seen it in Brazil, Hungary, Philippines, India, and in almost all of, in other places as well. And almost all of those places, social media are playing a role. I, I would really encourage you to look at um, the work and, and writing and story of Maria Reza who is from the Philippines. She's a former CNN journalist. Um, she's, the last time I talked to her, she was under house arrest, which was about six months ago. She may still be, because um, the Philippine government has basically concocted all of these false um, accusations against her and eventually may put her in jail. But essentially she's been telling, trying to tell Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg since 2015 that, um, that their platform was creating these toxicities that were reaffirming the power of this very authoritarian government that was becoming more and more authoritarian and, but through this sort of populist feedback loop where this grievance-based populism actually doesn't just feed the, the leader, but it changes the leader to make them more and more extreme, which we may have seen a little bit in our own ecosystems and it is part of it. And so, um, and she was warning Facebook saying, if you don't do anything about this, we may end up with a Donald Trump type character as president. And of course, you know, Mark Zuckerberg laughed at her in 2015 because it was, you know, far too early to see that that was eventually what was going to happen. Um, I'm not sure he laughed at her, but he laughed her off or, or, or was, um, her, you have to hear her story of it. It's very, very, very interesting, but it just, I mean, it's not just happening here. So it's not just one little thing that we could do differently in the U.S. Um, it's really a, a, this profound relationship between sort of how these social media platforms work these connections and sort of the larger geopolitical things that are happening in the world with income inequality and rearranging of different kinds of geopolitical relationships. So um, I think it's almost a mistake to be too focused on ourselves. We do need to fix ourselves, um, but just recognize this is a global fight against the rise of sort of populist authoritarianism. Should I take the next one from chat? Um... So someone, Deborah Santos is asking, just would it be a good idea to just stop reposting and passing along information? Would that slow down the, the flow of disinformation? Yeah, you know, there's, there's different ways to think about these things. I like to think of like, if I do it, then probably other people are doing it too. Um, for all sorts of things, if I, if I donate, probably other people would donate too, and that actually motivates me to donate. It also motivates me to do things like slow down. Certainly, um, since I started doing this work on disinformation, I, I repost a lot less content. I do try to re, you know, retweet or highlight the work of other scholars to raise their voices, but I'm really careful on anything that's newsworthy. Um, and certainly again, anything that makes me feel politically righteous, I just stay really far away from it. Um, and if I do write something, I write something my own thoughts or feelings about something, but I don't um, I don't often repost something else, um, especially in like 
the, the case of the day that makes us feel like we're on the right side of things. It's just a really um, <laughs> place that, I, that I, I just know that nine times out of 10, there's, yeah, I'm gonna be embarrassed about it later. So I just don't do it anymore. But that's not to say that we should silence our voices, right? So we, it, that doesn't mean that there, there's, there's important change that needs to happen right now. We're seeing what's happening in Texas on, on a couple of different fronts. And I don't mean to say that we need to be silent about those things. Absolutely. Um, you, you should feel like you should be able to post about these things. Just be careful about the tone and, and maybe use your own voice instead of re, re, um, repeating someone else's voice. Um, Kate, are there any organizations that are out there um, that are kind of thought leaders in this, I mean, you're obviously a thought leader, but sort of just uh, crossing kind of cross-border thought leaders that would be, you know, interesting to follow, kind of trying to, especially when we're talking about the cross-border issues that you raised, you know, the, the example that you raised in the Philippines, be interesting if we could share with, with folks any kind of organizations that are, you know, trying to um, not regulate, but um, bring some thoughtful consideration from a consumer standpoint. Yeah, let me think. I mean, I really like the first draft organization. Um, they've been sort of trying to help journalists do a better job in, in this in these spaces. Um, there's great research being done in the U.S. A lot of um, a lot of uh, great folks. Um, Joan Donovan at Harvard. Her, her team's fantastic. Sam Woolley down at UT Austin. There's a great group of research, including Dean Freelon and Daniel Kreiss out at the University of North Carolina, which talks about sort of the history of disinformation and um, and how it intersects with race and how um, it's been used to, to systematically oppress people of color, especially um, black Americans. Um, there's a great group at NYU comes up from the political science point of view. Uh, in terms of the global stuff, I don't know it as well. And that's my own sort of limitations. And I, and I it's, it's something that I, I definitely need to improve on. Um, the work of Jonathan Ong, uh, ONG and Cabanes, uh, around disinformation in um, Philippines is just fantastic. It's, there's like a network disinformation report that, that's available. And then there's a Stanford group that does um, their that's internet much. observatory. They do um, uh, lots and lots of reports about uh, disinformation for hire and disinformation in Africa, in the Middle East and other places. And so um, another great resource um, for that. And then there's a lot of different groups that have that have risen and they put out reports and, and there, there's so many I can't name them all. Um, and you each of them has their own. Is, you know, maybe we can just download and then we can include it in the in kind of our wrap up. But I mean, that was the question was asked privately. So that, that'd be awesome because I think people have just, I think we're all eager to learn more, especially on the cross border side. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question here from Cindy Barker. Um, what do you think about the current trend for TV news, especially Channel 13, who uses their airtime to read us what's trending on Twitter? Uh, do you think they ever vet it before going on air? Good question. <laughs> Such a fascinating story. Um, uh, I, yeah, no, I think, you know, there's, there's, these, there's a lot of relationships between sort of what's happening in journalism and what's happening elsewhere. And there's so many reasons for it, but journalism is under new pressure. So whether it's broadcast, whether TV news or our, our newspapers, they're under new pressure. They have less funding. They're making less money. They're trying to compete with social media. They can't compete with social media. They're trying to report on things with fewer people and fewer resources. And so their reporting ends up anchoring, you know, bringing in social media content or other like fast, that they're moving too fast. So they make more mistakes. They're using clickbait to try yeah. to compete, which, which reduces our trust in their product. And so there's these sort of really problematic relationships with, with journalism. And it's, it's not just an individual reporter's fault. It's like the whole industry or the profession is under these really interesting tensions. But I would definitely, I mean, I've talked to some of the local journalists. I've got one who's, who says, you know, if you ever have a problem, you know, tell me. And I'm like, oh, I have too many. You don't want to hear from me because I do watch the local news. And although they often do a great job. Um, things like putting in tweets, really, really dangerous. There's actually a study of how many times the Russian Internet Research Agency that their tweets ended up on our news programs. And it, it's not a little bit, it's a lot. And it talks about how it was like everyday person in the US and it was actually a Russian Russian troll that was featured. And so um, it's, it's, it's an easy way for, for the local news to become another conduit for this kind of, kind of thing. And so 
Um, I understand like during a breaking news event, that's where you can get a photograph or whatever, but I would just really encourage them to, 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 to keep vetting stuff. Um, and I wish I could convert, con convince consumers, you know, to still go to your local news and not, you know, and because the problem is this local news is trying to compete, you know, with, with these real time reporting and, and you can't and still do a good job. And people seem to prefer a bad job done fast to a, a good job done yep. slow. I, I have a question about um, some of the efforts by certain social media platforms to try to flag some content as being disinformation or misinformation. How effective is that? Are they doing a good, yeah. are they doing any good job? Are they doing anything? <laughs> or is yeah, it- Yeah, they're still, I mean, the, the research is still out, but this is, so for, from what I know, um, they don't really work. But that doesn't mean they, they never work. They work in very particular cases. They may work if a person is first encountering a piece of information for the first time or a new context, or it's about something that they haven't already made up their minds on. So if you're first encountering something about hydroxychloroquine and you don't yet know that it now has a political valence uh, in your discourse and you're aligned with one side or not, a, a label might work. Um, but if you've already made up your mind or you already know that that piece of information you, that people on your side are supposed to, to, to believe it or not believe it, um, you will find that those, those, those labels, when they say misinformation and somebody already believes it or has a reason to believe it, they'll just say, oh, look, big tech is censoring us again. More evidence that we're being censored. And so they're really, they're really not helping. And that's, that's even while they're novel, if eventually, and that's been the last couple of years because they started about 2020 with COVID, eventually um, people will just ignore them, <laughs> right? And they'll actually lose. So if they're not working now, they're not going to work better in the future. And so um, the platform, I think the platforms already kind of know that they're not working that well. I'm flagging um, with. And they're probably mostly using them to. Um, uh, you know, cover themselves just because they'll get complaints if they don't use the labels now, but it's not clear that they're doing a lot of good. Um, one more? Yeah, sure, why not? Um, so we have a question from Alan, and this is this kind of goes back, I think, to your original definitions about disinformation and misinformation, and also about how when there's intentionality behind them and not. What do you do when you, you close relatives live in different bubbles? So probably just like, how do you kind of defend or yeah. argue against dis or misinformation, understanding those two def definitions you gave us. <laughs> That's what we're gonna leave you with, Kate. <laughs> yeah, no, um, you love them <laughs> anyways, uh, if, if you can. Um, I, 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 uh, I mean, I think almost all of us can say, hey, I have a family member who, you know, who really, is on a diff different side of, of this equation and really thinks that the things I think are misinformation, they think that that's like canon, like that's what they believe. And um, I know that some of my family members think I'm the one spreading this information and, and really believe even the voter fraud thing. I'm like, I've literally, I've wrote a 300 page report on this. I can show you, I can take like 15 of these narratives and show you where they're completely like, there's nothing behind them. And still you're telling me that, that this is something you might believe in. And so, um, and I, you know, it's hard. I, I don't think, I don't think I, I, I know. I mean, I, I have my own family members that I've, that I've tried and it doesn't necessarily work. And so I just, I love them anyways, and they love me anyways. And we try to talk about other things. Um, I, I understand that not everyone can do that because sometimes it's really like, if the, if the misinformation is, you know, hurtful or harmful, it, it can be hard. I'm not going to tell everybody that they have to, that they have to keep keep the connections, but I do think if we want to move forward as a country, we have to somehow keep some of the connections to have something to, to build back on um, because we're in a bad place with some of this. And I, um, I'm worried that we'll come apart even further. And so where I can maintain the relationship, I, I, I am. But I, I, I know that would be hard for others. And I don't say that, it, I wouldn't expect everyone to be able to do that. I think with that, we should probably wrap it up for this evening. This has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I knew it would be, and it certainly fulfilled that. So thank you very much. And for everybody who's still on the, on the, the Zoom meeting, um, thank you for attending. And um, remember to stay engaged. That seems like the thing to do nowadays. So 
um, and we'll hopefully see you at our next event. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Sherbert. All right. Thank you again for inviting me. And thanks for the great questions. You bet. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.